I have had plenty of, of humbling experiences in my life. Now, I'm generally a verbal processor, which has led to me putting my foot in my own mouth a few too many times. But there's one situation that perhaps is, is just the most humbling for me. Now, not too long ago, as I was putting some of my kids to bed, one of my kids made a comment that kind of made fun of one of their siblings. And as parents, you've probably never experienced anything like that, of course. But, <laughs> well, I corrected that child and I tried to help them to see just, you know, how they would feel if the same thing had been sent to them. You know, how would you feel, you know, child, if, if I or someone else made fun of you, you know, a word that you mispronounced? And, you know, and then, I, of course, I had to go through the Ephesians 4.29. Well, let's say only what's good for building up. And my kid wasn't super happy to be corrected. But then they said something that was pretty hard to hear. They said something like, Dad, haven't you done that? I was like, what, what do you mean? You know, and, and then the other kid who was being made fun of said, Yeah, Dad, you've, you've done that to me before. And suddenly I was, I was surrounded. Yeah, have you ever had one of your children bring up the fact that you didn't obey scripture? Ouch. You know, and, and so in this situation, I, I had kind of a, a fork in the road. I could have responded one of two different ways from that kind of call out from my own offspring. You know, I can say this. I could say, listen, buddy. I'm a pastor. You know, I've been reading the Bible since before you were born. You know, I have, I have verses memorized in biblical Greek, okay? Or I, can, or I can say something like this, you know, you're right, buddy. That is what that verse means. And I didn't obey God there because they are right. You know, and, and in this situation, and the reason that that's so difficult, and it was so difficult for me, is not because I don't already know that they're right, but because inside, every part of me is, is screaming at the idea of admitting I was wrong, especially to a little person that I made. You know, because even though I know I was wrong, I struggle with my pride. And I'll let you know how I responded to that situation a little bit later. You know, first, does, does anyone else struggle with pride here? You know, raise a hand. Okay, so look around you in the room. Anyone who isn't raising their hands is struggling with pride right now. <laughs> no, but seriously, we all struggle with pride a bit, don't we? Admitting that you were wrong stings. Or, or sometimes just humbling yourself can hurt because what this does is it, it lowers us in the eyes of, of someone else. Or maybe even just in our own eyes. And suddenly we can't you know, stand as tall as we could before when we admit we were wrong. And who wants that? Now, this gets even shakier when it comes to something we feel pretty strongly about, doesn't it? So we are currently in the second week of a five-week series on how to be a Christian during the election. And while that might seem a little silly to spend five weeks talking about how to be a Christian during this election season, when you actually stop and, and think about it, it's really not all that Simple, you know, questions pop up all over in our minds on, on different people, different policies. The decision making alone can be overwhelming. And as we've said before, <laughs> we're living in one of the most di divisive times we've ever seen in our country. So what we want to do as, as pastors is help to kind of level set and realign our hearts with what's really important. And hopefully what we learn together during this series can help guide us through this, this whole uh, sticky election season. Last week, Brent talked about how we should be led by love, not hate. And how we as, as God's children should imitate him as we seek to love others. But what about when it comes to important issues? I mean, aren't we supposed to are we really supposed to humble ourselves and, and love other people when they stand against what we feel is right? You know, or, or how do we react when someone points out a flaw in our own ideologies 
especially if it's true. Are we supposed to just sit back and get hit by criticism? You know, an election season is a time when we do our research on candidates, you know, policies, you name it. And then we, we muster up our resolve to stand for our convictions in and out of the polls. So when someone makes us aware of, of a chink in our armor, some sort of flaw in our preferred candidate or, or a stance that we take, how do we react to that? You know, don't you just want to make that, that family member or that coworker or neighbor just kind of eat their words a little bit? We know that God wants us to love others, as Brent talked about. But if I admit that I'm wrong about something or, or that I didn't consider a stance that I took as much as I thought I did, wouldn't I just look weak? You know, when someone points out a, a crack in, in a brick in the wall of our stances, won't the whole wall just come crumbling down? Won't I gain more respect and, and approval by being strong rather than looking weak? You know, Brent showed those yard signs last week. Do, do I really have to be humble in how I respond to someone with that yard sign? And you might be thinking, do I really have to listen to and, and give the benefit of, of the doubt to the person at work who's going to vote for that person? Do I have to sit back and watch someone make a post on social media that was so ill-informed and wrong? If I don't stand my ground and, and win in the conversation with that opinionated family member, aren't they just being a doormat? And this is what we can struggle with. This question here, <laughs> which is coming. <laughs> there we go. How do I honor Jesus with my convictions without losing ground? You know, how do I make sure that I'm being led by humility, not pride? And that is where we are going to be digging into today. But before we do, let's pray. Oh Lord, we, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to trust in you during a difficult time. We also thank you that uh, you're in control of, of anything and, and everything that's going on in the world today. And we thank you for your example of what we're going to be talking about today. Open our hearts, lead us to listen to you and put you first in everything. In Jesus' name, amen. So, First, as we get into this topic, let's dive into scripture and talk about humility versus pride. Now, the Bible gives us a lot of insight into why humility is the way we need to live and why pride is something we need to avoid. Well, first, James says this, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, let's break that down. It doesn't just say that God dislikes pride. It says he opposes the proud. Imagine that if we choose pride in how we interact with each other, we're putting ourselves in direct opposition to God. That's a big deal. It means pride isn't just a, a character flaw. It's a force that actively puts us at odds with the creator of the universe. But what does James say that God does for the humble? It says he gives grace. And that's not just God tolerating us. It's him giving us his unmerited, undeserved favor, his, his kindness and his power when we need it the most. Now, Proverbs 16, 18 is another one that maybe you've heard before. And it says this, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. I think of how many times We've seen a proud leader rise up in history, full of arrogance, only to be brought down in a very public way. And it's not just in politics, it's in all walks of life. Pride eventually causes destruction, and the fall is often great and painful. And the higher we lift ourselves up, the harder we fall when we come crashing down. You know, on, on the flip side, we see that God always responds to humility. 
Now, there's this beautiful story in, in Luke 18 where Jesus talks about this and this, this parable of the Pharisee. I'm not going to have it all up here, but it's this parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector that illustrates this just, just perfectly. So here's, there's this Pharisee that's standing in front of the temple and he's full of himself. He's just praying out loud about how great he is, how he tithes and how he fasts. Now, he isn't like that guy, the, the sinner over there, that tax collector. And meanwhile, the tax collector can't even lift his eyes to heaven. He's so low in his own mind. And he just says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And what does Jesus say? He said that it was the humble tax collector who went home justified before God, not the self-righteous Pharisee. God values humility even if the world around us might not. And humility might feel like losing ground. It might feel like we're exposing ourselves to criticism or, or even losing respect. But with God, humility is how we find real strength and, and favor. Choosing humility means to align ourselves with God in the right posture instead of standing against him. And that's the safest and most powerful place we could be. Last week, Brent shared three disciplines from Justin Gibney's series on civic revival, how to be a Christian during the election. And this week, I believe that two of his principles really speak to the heart of what we're discussing today. And that is humility versus pride during the election season. Now, in his fourth principle, uh, Justin lays out this. He says, be aware of the flaws. Gibney reminds us that our political ideologies, you know, our, our parties and our, our candidates, they're not perfect. Not a single one of them are perfect. In fact, one of the most powerful things we can do as Christians during an election series is self-examine, right? Or, or, or look inside ourselves and recognize where our preferred political stances fall short of God's standard. And let's not joke ourselves and think that this is easy to do. This takes humility. And the kind of humility that Paul talks about in Philippians 2, and, and I know that we hear about Philippians 2 pretty often, but I'd like to just take a deeper dive into it this week. And it says this, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. What Paul is getting at here is that humility begins with this self-examination, right? We need to be willing to admit that our own stances, our own political ideologies, and even our preferred candidates, they have flaws. And here's where it gets really challenging. I mean, we need to admit that publicly and openly, not just kind of internally and with grumbling. <laughs> Let's face it, this is a tough pill to swallow, especially during the election season when everyone is looking to win arguments and prove that their side is right. You know, we get scared that if we admit to a flaw or a weakness in our position, we'll look weak or, or lose ground but where valuing others above ourselves comes in is, you know, it's not winning arguments. That's not what it's about. Philippians 2, 5 through 7, just a couple verses later, shows us the ultimate example of humility in Jesus. And it says this, you must, not should, not might, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. I just want you to think about this for a moment. Jesus didn't hold on to his rightful position as the son, in God, son of God. No, instead he humbled or, or lowered himself, becoming a servant. If Jesus could lay aside his, his power and his, his rights and even his desire to not be misunderstood or unfairly categorized or, or criticized or, or represented, 
then can't we lay aside our pride long enough to see the flaws in our own political tribes, ideologies, or candidates, as, as Justin Gibney puts it? This might mean when, you know, that we, we need to be willing to admit that while we support certain policies or politicians, we recognize where they fall short. You know, either political party has policies that Jesus might not have practiced or, or condoned personally. Being honest and humble about these flaws is a way of aligning ourselves with the truth, not just with party loyalty. And this leads directly into Justin's fifth principle. And he says this, identify the virtue on the other side. <laughs> this one's really hard, and it's a bit harder because it requires us to see the good in people that we disagree with. It is so, so easy during this election season to focus on what we disagree with, you know, to see the other side as nothing but wrong. But again, what, what Paul teaches us in Philippians 3 and, and 4 is to, is to be humble, right? Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Not just looking out for your own interests, but taking an interest in others too. This is radical. Paul is, is telling us that we need to consider the interests, the concern, the values of others. Yeah, even, even the people with those yard signs, as Brent put it. You know, Gibney points out that many Christians who vote for democratic policies do so because of an impulse toward compassion, while many who vote for Republican policies do so out of a concern for, for order and for justice. Both of those are virtues, right? And, and both are rooted in, in pretty godly principles. But when we approach the others, you know, with pride, we only focus on the flaws and we miss the opportunity to see what they're striving for, you know, why they made those decisions in the first place. And this is part of what Paul is talking about in verses five through seven. It's, it takes a conscious effort to set your own position aside, to, to give up privileges in order to see where someone else is coming from, especially if they disagree with you. Romans 14.1 gives us a, a model for how we should handle differences within the body of Christ. It, it says, accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. You know, in our church, there are people who will vote in different ways according to their conscience. And, and Paul here is reminding us that it's not our job to judge them on these disputable matters, but rather to extend grace and focus on what's important. Identifying the virtue on the other side is an important part of practicing humility. You know, it's acknowledging that just because someone disagrees with you Politically, it doesn't actually mean they're evil or, or stupid. It means they may have a different perspective, a, a different virtue that's driving their decision. And when we can acknowledge that, we're practicing the very humility that Paul talks about in Philippians 2. And that is where we can begin to have really godly, amazing conversations. You know, that's where we start to remember how the kingdom of God is absolutely supposed to be the most important thing to us, you know, more important to us even than the kingdom of the United States of America. And that's where we can have political convictions about, about political policies, even strong ones, but we never let them rise above who we are in Christ. So, so how do we honor Christ with our convictions when we feel like we're losing ground? Well, we remember what ground we're actually trying to take, and that's fighting for people's hearts rather than winning arguments. And humility wins hearts, where pride it just loses influence. You know, by following these two principles, right? Being aware of the flaws and identifying the virtue on the other side, we reflect 
the humility of Jesus Christ that we read about in Philippians 2. And here's the beauty of it. Humility doesn't actually mean losing ground. What it really means is gaining something far more valuable, the opportunity to win hearts for Christ. It means to to build bridges instead of walls and to demonstrate the grace and humility that Jesus himself modeled for us. And as we do that, as we humble and, and lower ourselves, we're actually lifted up. But if we choose to kind of stick to our guns, you know, and and put people below policies. And what I mean here is in our conversations, in, in the way that we represent Christ to the world around us, not in the voting booth. But if we choose pride here, the Bible says that God is going to oppose us. And that is an opponent that you and I, we can't win against. Paul's example shows us that it's not about winning debates or or being right all the time. It's about laying aside our pride, admitting our weaknesses, and showing the love of Christ in every conversation, even political ones. Going back to the situation where I, you know, one of my own kids rebuked me with the Bible, at first I responded in, in pride. You know, I defended myself on how I was only trying to make the kid laugh when I said it, but when you said it, you know, it was wrong. You know, I was laughing with them, not not at them. And then I kind of quickly put them into bed. And, you know, a few minutes later, I think the Holy Spirit just made me aware of just how prideful I was being. And so I went back into the room and, and pulled the kid aside. And I thanked them. I told them how... I could see how my example led you to do the same thing I did. I was made aware of my flaws. I I was painfully aware of my flaws because a child pointed them out to me. Well, the display of humility to my kids that was, again, led by the Holy Spirit led to one of the sweetest interactions I have ever had with this child. It led to tears and embraces, and it was beautiful. You know, we've explored what the Bible says about humility versus pride and how we should model our own lives around Jesus' example in Philippians 2. But now we get to the harder part. You know, how do we actually practice humility, especially in the middle of something as polarizing as this election season? You know, being humble, particularly during a time like this, means laying down our desire to be right and embracing something harder you know, self-examination. And remember, just as Gibney talks about in his disciplines that we've gone over, we need to be aware of the flaws in our own ideological tribes, our, our political preferences, our opinions, and even our loyalties. You know, they're not flawless. And that can be a tough pill to swallow. But it, it begins by learning to hear the word of God against ourselves, as Gibney says. You know, remember, Philippians 2 says, don't be selfish. You know, don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. And when we're acting in that kind of humility, we're not just lowering ourselves, but the verse says we're actually elevating others, right? And that's hearing the word against ourselves, right? Seeing, we're seeing others as we elevate them as people made in God's image, not not just opponents to be defeated. And so how do we do this in in practical terms? Here's a start. Ask before you argue. You know, when someone shares a political opinion that's different from yours, even if it stirs up those angry emotions in you, and maybe instead of rushing to defend your position, why not start by just asking a genuine question? You know, James 1.19 says this, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. It's hard, but it's necessary. I mean, Im- imagine the difference it would make in our influence if, if instead of saying, hey, you're wrong, you said, hey, I'd love to understand what led you to that decision or why you feel that way. You know, humility begins by listening to and and acknowledging that we may not have all of the answers. (laughs) And 
that person that feels differently than we do may not actually be sent from the devil to harm us. (laughs) And let me just clarify here. Humility does not mean we compromise on truth. No way. It doesn't mean that we stop standing for what's right, but it does mean that we allow humility to guide our conversations. You know, Proverbs 15.1 says, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. When we approach others with the spirit of humility and, and gentleness, even political conversations can turn into opportunities for connection and for understanding, you know, opportunities for the gospel. And when it comes to Self-examination, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7, when he says this, and why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? You know, you've heard that probably a million times, but before we criticize others and before we try to pick apart their political stands or or behavior, we need to examine our own flaws and and inconsistencies, our, our weaknesses, This is a hard thing to do, but it does show Christ-like humility to a broken world. Humility in action is about asking questions. It's, It's about listening well and seeing a person who is made in God's image, not just that person's opinions. It's about choosing to understand people before even being understood. And as we do that, as we reflect the heart of Christ, just like a mirror, so that they will, they'll see when they look at us. When they look at us, they'll see the reflection of Jesus. And when they do that, when, when we reflect Jesus, we honor him with our conversations. Let's be a church that demonstrates humility, not, not just in, in theory, but in the way we actually engage with others, especially during this election series. So let's take this one step deeper. You know, we've talked about how we are to model Jesus' example of humility, you know, by by putting others before ourselves. And while that's so important for us as Christians during an election season, we need to focus here on, on the why. You know, if we really want to understand the ultimate picture of humility, we we look to the cross, of course. And as we go back to Philippians 2 here, let's look at it through a, a different lens. And it says this, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Now, why on earth would the king of all the universe lower himself like this? Jesus had had every right to exalt himself. He's, He's the son of God. He's the creator of the universe. It says in Colossians that he holds everything together. He could have demanded the honor and glory he deserved and he would have been right to do it. But instead he chose humility. He left the glory of of heaven to take on the form of a servant, being born to a lowly teenage girl that meant nothing to the rest of the world. He humbled himself to the point of dying a, a criminal's death, it says, being hung naked on a cross. This is our God. And he he went to the most shameful, most humiliating, most painful form of execution all for you, for me. Think about this. Jesus' humility had, had a destination. He humbled himself for a purpose to bring us salvation. He didn't win souls by shouting louder, by overpowering his opponents, or by proving that he was right. You know, we're never really called in scripture to to flip tables like Jesus did. No, no, he won souls through sacrificial love and humility, lowering himself. Even though he had rights, even though he had privileges, And that's the model that we're called to follow. 
especially during this election season. Jesus didn't die to win an argument. He died to win our hearts. And the truth is, humility can sometimes feel like we're losing ground, especially in a world that that praises power and and self-promotion. But Jesus shows us that real influence comes through laying down our pride, not, not exalting ourselves. His ultimate act of humility saved us, and our humility can be a witness to others of that same salvation. So if you're here today and you've never experienced that beautiful humility and love of Jesus firsthand, let me just tell you, he humbled himself for you. He went to the cross because he loves you. He offers you a relationship with him that changes everything. And if you've been walking with Jesus for a while, let this message be a reminder that we are called to follow his example, not just in in word, but in action. Let's be people who are led by humility, not, not pride, especially during this election season. Let's be people who honor Jesus, not by winning arguments, but by winning hearts. And let's remember, just like Jesus, that true influence doesn't come through exalting ourselves, but by humbling ourselves so that others can see Jesus in us. So this election season, let's remember our calling to love people, even people that oppose and and persecute us, like, like Brent talked about. Jesus isn't asking us to win political arguments, but to live in such a way that we gain influence and win hearts. And that begins with humility. Humility wins hearts where pride loses influence. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your example in in setting all that you deserved, all that you owned, all that you were aside so that you could become a person, live a perfect life, and then die a sinner's death to pay for all of our sins so that we could become your righteousness, so that we could have put on us your perfect life. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see all of our sin, all of our filth anymore, but he sees your perfect righteousness. And Jesus, help us to remember as we go out in the world and as we have these conversations about policies, which can be good, They can be great. Help us to remember what comes first, and that's you, and that's your gospel. Help us to be seasoned with salt, seasoned with grace as we go out to a world that's broken and hurting and show them the answer. And that's not necessarily just our our policies and our, our politics, but it's you. Help us, Lord. Give us grace in Jesus' name. Amen.